I'm Joe, Joe Jasinski, and I work for Imaginary Landscape, and I've been doing Jenga development for about four years. And I wanted to talk to you today about a topic I find really interesting, and that's uh, GeoJango and GIS applications. So a little bit of background about how I got into this. A few years back, Chicago had a mobile app building competition, and uh, they made available a, a data portal for the city for use with this competition and other reasons. And um, I built a simple little app that kind of showed uh, various um, cool, interesting things to do around uh, CTA train stops. And um, though I didn't win any awards for this, it kind of inspired me to uh, learn more about this technology over the next few years. And I continued to build on this project and uh, play with it. And some of the examples from this talk are going to be straight out of that project. So first, I'd like to cover a few general definitions that I found useful. Um, one of them is um, a coordinate reference system. And this is a system to locate geospatial entities on a map. And there are two basic types. There's uh, geographic coordinate systems, which represent the Earth as a sphere or spheroid. And there's uh, projected coordinate systems, which project, uh, project maps into a flat surface. And you've probably heard all the problems with projected coordinate systems and that um, you get map distortions if you flatten a map from a sphere. So um, they're particularly good at representing local data and not so much like zoomed out data. So coordinate systems are important because um, data could be encoded in any number of coordinate systems and you need a way to like normalize that data so you can perform math and display them on the same, on the same map. So uh, a spatial coordinate or a coordinate system registry is another thing. Uh, the, main, the primary um, registry is called the EPSG. And this is an authority that like catalogs and maintains different coordinate systems. And it uniquely identifies coordinate systems by a spatial reference ID. And uh, so, uh, so that's how spatial reference systems are kind of um, named is based off that ID. There's a great resource called spatialreference.org, which is a nice index for coordinate systems. And it, uh, it has a lot of information about each system and, and defines the definition of the co coordinate systems in a, various, a variety of different formats. Uh, one very common coordinate system that you'll, you'll encounter a lot if you use this is WSG84. WSG and it's a geographic coordinate system, meaning it represents the Earth as a sphere, spheroid. And it's used by the GPS system. So it, you'll find a lot of data encoded in this um, system. It also goes by the name uh, EPSG4326, which is the um, spatial reference ID for it. Um, so you'll probably encounter this a bunch. I'd like to talk about uh, Postgres and PostGIS. And me, I personally, when I use GeoDjango, my preferred backend of choice is um, uh, PostGIS uh, Post and, and Postgres. First of all, I, you know, I love Postgres. And um, GeoDjango typically has better support or more functions available for um, Postgres. Um, so it's a good choice for working with uh, GeoData. And, PostGIS uh, went through a major update not too long ago to a, ver a version 2.0 update, and it's become a lot easier to install. For an Ubuntu 14.04 system, you just need to install a bunch of app dependencies and um, switch to the database you want to use and run a create extension command. It's now an extension. So it's um, really easy to get started working with it on a new system. Um, I've also included a, a link on here You'll be able to see in the slides um, for just some quick installation steps for Ubuntu, Ubuntu 14.04 and CentOS 7. So I'm going to refer to this diagram a few times throughout the talk. Um, it's basically um, the architecture stack that I'm going to build up. And let's assume that we've gone through the Django tutorial and uh, installed GeoDjango and hooked it up with our um, PostGIS database. And this is what we have so far. This is what it will look like. Um, a few other notes about um, PostGIS. When you run that extension, it will cr create a bunch of different objects in your database. Um, it will create functions and stored procedures to do geometric oper operations, but it will also create a new table called the spatial ref sys table. And this is basically a tableized form of the data from spatialreference.org. Uh, it has the spatial reference IDs and different, um, different definitions for the coordinate systems that that uh, GeoDjango and or PostGIS can use to do conversions between coordinate systems. Um, also, there's two 
new views that will be created in your database, one called the geometry columns and one called geography columns views, and these um, have these identify which columns in your database are spatially enabled. Uh, previous to PostGIS 2.0, uh, these were tables and not views, so um, you had to manually maintain these these tables. Uh, but uh, uh, and well, if you use GeoDjango, GeoDjango would take care of that for you. But uh, uh, as of 2.0, you don't no longer have to do that since they're views and they're dynamically calculated. So one thing when you're working with uh, after we've got the database set up and Django set up, um, the next question is where do I get data? And um, I found my data source on Chicago's um, data portal, which was great. There was uh, like hundreds of different um, data files that I could use. But there's data sources all over the place. I, don't know, I was really surprised. Every major city has their own data portal, it, it seems like. You just do a Google and you'll find a lot of example data you can play with. Um, so, uh, um, and that's just the open data you can get. Um, Another place to get data is the OpenStreetMap project. And this is kind of like a, a crowdsourced Wikipedia of maps thing. And data is available um, under an open license, so you can get a lot of data out of, out of this um, website. It's a pretty cool, um, uh, pretty cool site and tool. So now that we've identified some potential data sources, and uh, these sources provide data in all sorts of formats, and now we have to import those uh, formats import that data into the database so we can start using it. So there's a few serialization formats I'd like to talk about. And the first one is called uh, well-known text. And this is just um, a tech or a string-based format for identifying geometry. So here's some examples of point objects and string objects. They're just um, you know, basic text representations of the geometry that you can load into your, in your database. Well-known text is used in a lot of places, and including one of the columns in the spatial refsys table defines um, each coordinate system in well-known text format. So it's not only for geographic data, it's also for defining reference systems. So Django has uh, uh, built-in support for loading well-known text data with using this OGR ge geometry class, which takes a uh, constructor argument for your geography or geometry data and it will create a Python object that you can then assign to a model or, or, or uh, do whatever you want with. Another serialization format is called uh, Keyhole Markup Language, you might have heard of, it's KML. And it's an XML based format um, developed by Keyhole Inc, which was then bought up by Google and is now uh, used in Google Earth. So um, it's obviously a good format for sending data to Google Maps and to Google Earth but it's a serialization format so you can use it however you want. There's some Python utilities um, called Simple KML and Fast KML that you can use to uh, load and manipulate data in, in KML. Uh, GeoJSON is another obvious choice for a serialization format and um, it's developed and maintained by a independent group on the internet so um, it's, there's no specific authority, it's just like a mailing list that, of people that uh, define how this format should work. And it's a JSON representation of your data. And it's a nice option to send data to a browser if you're, um, you know, it's because JavaScript is nice to work with in the browser. There's a good Python utility for working with this um, on the Python level called uh, GeoJSON. All of these formats are serializable by GeoDjango, so you can um, print out various um, geometry objects um, in these respective formats. And finally, I'd like to mention um, the shapefile format, which is a, an extremely common format for persisting uh, geospatial data to files specifically. And it was a format developed by the ESRI, which is a, uh, a company that makes uh, a very um, popular open, or a very popular product called ArcGIS um, for geo, geospatial data. That's um, an expensive program, but it's uh, used, used in the industry a bunch. And shapefiles are kind of misnamed because they're not really a single file, they're a collection of files. Um, so you'll find at least three files in a shapefile archive. It's usually like a zip or something. Um, but each file has a different purpose and you can have up to like 10 or so different files representing the same geometry. Uh, Django has some support for loading this type of um, object using uh, 
this data source class. You can import um, shapefile data. And also there's a, a Python library called PyShape, which um, you can use to help get data into your application. So you can create a Python-based importer using the tools I just mentioned, or you can take advantage of some command line tools um, to load this data. One of them is uh, shape to PGSQL or OGR to OGR. I'm not gonna get into detail on those, but uh, they're, they're very powerful and they have a lot of different options you can pass to them to um, import different types of geodata. So I'd like to talk a little bit about um, server-based geo utilities. And the first one is um, the project or Proj4 library, which is a, uh, a dependency for GeoDjango and it's uh, responsible for um, converting between different projections. And also the spatial ref sys table in PostGIS has a column called Proj4 text, which, which also stores a definition for a projection in Proj4 format, so there's, there's an additional, um, that's what Proj4 can use to do map projection conversions. Um, also, I've used Proj4, or more specifically, a Python wrapper for it called PyProj, uh, that, um, to translate points on a map. And in my particular use case, I filled in a shape uh, with evenly spaced um, points by, uh, by transforming a, a single point into multiple directions. And I use this for like generating a, source, a group of source points for creating a heat map. Another great utility for um, working with data on the server side, geodata on the server side, is called MapNIC. And it's um, basically a tool that you use if you want to re render maps to images. And it's great for, it's, there's a lot of Python support for it. It's got some Python bindings. Um, so you can write you can use this tool to uh, write just flat JPEGs or images that you can use in reports. We can also, um, you can also, be, it also can be used by a map tiling engine, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So here's our um, stack architecture diagram again. Um, you'll notice I added uh, Mapnik to it, and you see it's uh, making a direct connection to PostGIS. And uh, Mapnik supports a variety of different data sources. Um, shape files, CSV, GeoJSON, and in the last slide you saw PostGIS. Um, and each data source is added as a layer, um, so it kind of takes a layered approach and the topmost layers show up on top. Um, but one of the nice features about MapNIC is the fact that you can style your maps. Just geodata geo by itself isn't very useful unless you can visually represent it. So it's got a pretty um, sophisticated way to uh, style data. You can either use its Python API to like build up styles, or you can create an XML style um, definition that you can load and use um, to style your, your different data layers. So here's a very simple map, MapNIC example, and um, I'm using the XML uh, style sheet in this example. So I'm loading the XML file. I'm creating a new map object, I'm defining a subquery to pull in data from my map, and then I'm, I'm creating a, connecting to the PostGIS uh, database. I'm adding that uh, data source um, as a layer to uh, MapNIC, and then I'm rendering it to a JPEG. And this image at the top right here is uh, partially constructed by this query I created here, so that's kind of uh, what you can do with it. So MapNIC XML is not very pretty. It's, um, it's XML, and I never want to work with it. So that's where a program called TileMill comes into play. And TileMill is a Node.js-based Node desktop application. It's open source, but it's maintained by a company called Mapbox, which does um, hosted map mapping. And it supports bunch of standard formats for importing data, including PostGIS and shape, shape files. And it's built on top of MapNIC, so it's making calls to MapNIC to render, uh, render the images that display in its interface. Um, and as a result, uh, uh, it also can be used to generate that MapNIC XML. That's the most important thing that I use it for. So the reason why I like TileMill is because it has something called map style sheets. And map style sheets is a, is a language or a markup language similar to CSS or, or more, most similar to less.js. And um, you can change the behavior of how your maps will look 
in a very intuitive um, fashion at different zoom levels and uh, it's, it's a really cool application to add lots of style to your app uh, or to your maps. Uh, on the back end, um, uh, TileMill is using another Node.js library called Cardo and um, Cardo will convert map style sheets to uh, MapNIC XML. And uh, so you can call this command on the command line if you've installed it to just do this translation yourself so you don't have to even use uh, tile mill if you don't want to, you can do this all from the command line. Another great tool for working with uh, geodata is called Quantum GIS. It's another desktop application. It's, got, it's written in C and Python, and so you can make calls to it from your Python scripts. And I use this to uh, <coughs> visualize and, and prototype my applications. And this, I use it differently than tile mill because tile mill is, I think, better at um, styling your maps, whereas QGIS is more like a data editor. So they both, they, they both kind of can work in conjunction. And, um, uh, but if you really just want to get some data on your map, um, QGIS is a, or to, to visualize and make sure it looks good, QGIS is a great application to do that. So now that we have like some tools to work with the data, um, let's pretend we've created some geo queries using the Django documentation to, uh, to, to do some fun queries with GeoDjango, and, and now we need to take that data and deliver it to the browser. So when I say this, I'm referring to two types of data that I typically send to the browser, and one is geography data, vector data like uh, uh, KML or um, you know, defined shapes or K KML or GeoJSON, and another one is uh, rendered map tiles, um, using MapNIC as kind of the source for that. So to create um, geography data, you can use any type of serializer you want, uh, but one that I found that was really useful is one called REST Framework GIS. And it's basically a, a plugin or a, an application that rides on top of Django REST Framework that defines the serializer so you can just easily um, uh, turn query sets into GeoJSON output. And so this is um, you know, particularly useful for Again, reading stuff from uh, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to use and install. And then map tiling, you're, you're, you may be familiar with. Uh, Google Maps is a good example of it. As you're um, zooming into a mapping application, it's loading in image tiles from a server. And as you, you zoom in, the, um, the tiles kind of get more and more detailed. But there's open source solutions to do map tiling. And one popular solution, Python-based solution, is called Tilestash. And, um, it, it, renders, it renders map tiles in real time, it caches them, and then it serves them up as you access them. So uh, you can also use uh, MapNIC to, uh, as the back-end rendering engine for this, so, um, and, and set a, map, a MapNIC style XML file to, uh, to dynamically add your styles. And you can set data sources um, just like you can with MapNIC and, and the other applications. Um, it takes a very simple URL scheme. If you visit this URL, or you run the server, you visit this URL in your browser, you'll load a single map tile. You're basically giving it a, a layer name, which is something you define in the configuration, a zoom level, um, a column and row, which corresponds to a tile location, um, and a geo coordinate. So um, here's basically what the, the stack looks like now that I've added. Um, tile stash on top of MapNIC and Django REST Framework on top of, um, and REST Framework GIS on top of uh, Django. Um, now that we have the back end set, we need something to read it from the front end, the, the JavaScript level. And there's a bunch of JavaScript client libraries that are used to actually render a slippy, slippy map application um, so you can zoom and interact with it uh, in the browser. And one of those is um, obviously Google Maps. It's a, a great tool for um, just getting up and running, and it's used everywhere. It's, it's got a great API. But it has some downsides in that it's, um, you're kind of beholden to their API, so if it changes, you've got to update your code. Uh, it's kind of got the same look and feel uh, across sites. Uh, there's not a lot of level for, or a lot, a lot of F ways you can customize it um, to look a lot different. There's, I'm sure there's some, but, um, and you also lose control of the mapping stack. Um, here's a quick example of a code using um, Google Maps. And in this example, I'm defining a map object. 
I'm assigning the map to a div and I'm adding a click event ha handler so I can click on a point on the map and it will load in, in this case, a KML file. And um, Google Maps automatically takes care of the map tiling for me, so it's, that's nice that I don't have to think about that. It just pulls in uh, map tile data as it needs it and it o o superimposes your vector data on top of it. Open layers is another good option for map, uh, a JavaScript client library. It's one of the oldest uh, open source options for map tiling, and it's the only downside is it's very large. It's like 700 kilobytes. They just released a new version, um, so maybe they helped fix some of that size problem. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, a project called Leaflet has come into play, which I personally like. It's, uh, it's uh, very small, lightweight. Um, it's got a nice plug-in system, and it's easy to use. Here's a, a quick example of um, a leaflet code base. Uh, I'm defining a map. I'm setting a tile server URL. I'm loading some data from a, a JSON um, endpoint, and then I'm adding a click handler to pull in uh, um, some data as I click on a map. And you'll notice the big difference between this example and the Google Maps example is that I am setting a map, a map tiling server URL. And in the comments above there, I have a few different map tile servers that I found that just have different, um, different types of tiles. You can include your own if you run your own map tiling server. Uh, but uh, it gives you a little bit more customization in terms of uh, what you see on the map. So after that, we've kind of completed our stack. Um, in this, this diagram, I'm using Leaflet as the, the JavaScript front end. It's pulling in uh, map tile data and GeoJSON data, uh, connecting with the, the back end. And um, that's kind of, that's how I've architected some of this stuff. Um, this is a, um, a pretty sophisticated, sophisticated topic. There's a lot to it, so there's only so much I can cover in about 25 minutes. But there's some other technologies that I just want to point out that, um, that you should Google because uh, if you're interested in the stuff. One of them is uh, PG routing, which is uh, um, another Postgres, ex Postgres extension for uh, defining graphs of data and doing routing with different uh, routing calculations. Uh, there's another front end um, app a JavaScript application called Modest Maps. It looks similar to Leaflet to me. Um, uh, if you're looking for a JavaScript, cl JavaScript client, that might be something to take a look at. Uh, Grass GIS is a, um, a tool similar to um, uh, QGIS. It's, it's very, uh, it's been around for a long time and open source as well. Um, uh, another thing to take a look at. Uh, Marble is a cool um, KDE project that um, is like a Google Earth replacement. Um, something to kind of look at as well. Uh, that's uh, what I have for the talk so far. Uh, I have some links to more references in the top link there. If you're interested, um, some just links I found useful and definitions. Um, also, if you're interested in seeing like a working project, I have a GitHub project with uh, some of this experimentation that I've done. Um, it's, uh, um, it probably could use a little bit more polish, but it gets the idea across. Anyway, I, I appreciate uh, your attention and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>